Morning, everyone. I walked up. I did all my running on Tuesday. I actually thought I did really well, actually. Now I come to think of it. But anyway, so we've come a long way. We've come a long way since uh, Tuesday, and now it's Friday. And I think, as Darcy alluded to, we've probably come a long way as a, as a collective sort of um, practice, because here we are. We at FICO, we've been talking about analytics for very many, many years now, and here we are now with a panel of people called Chief Analytics Officers. And um, I think it's going to be fascinating to kind of figure out where these guys fit in. And we're going to talk about where they fit in. We're going to talk a little bit about, about analytics itself and what kind of things they do in their life that are analytic. And then we couldn't have a conversation like this without talking about talent and um, you know, how, how they recruit talent and so on and so forth. So we're sort of going to run through those as topics, and then we're going to look for questions towards the end. Now, um, what I thought I would do is I wouldn't do, and I'll, I'll say a few words of introduction to them in a moment, but I thought I wouldn't do the pantomime thing, where we go, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, you know, it's behind you. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. So who in the room likes to gamble? And I know the Australians do, because I was in Australia last week, and the entire country stopped for the Melbourne Cup. So put your hands up. Who, who, likes, to, who likes to gamble? Who would like to do better at gambling? Maybe a different question, right? Eh? <laughs> so good. So we, we have, amongst our esteemed guests, we have Ruben, who is the chief analytics officer at Caesars Entertainment. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a minute. And, and I guess there's, if I ask you this next question about who in the room is interested in analytics, many hands would go up. And so here we've got three esteemed people who know an awful lot about analytics. And so now is the time to get your questions ready to ask the questions when we get to that at the end. You've got a little while to think about it, so get ready. Because this is a panel session. It's about us, and it's also about you. Um, and this is also a first for me. I've been to a hell of a lot of these um, FICO world things over the years. But, but last night was a first for me, because it was the first time that I was in my room um, only having had two beers on the ultimate evening of FICO World in my entire, however many years it is now, attending FICO Worlds. That's what you get for having to do a session at 9 o'clock on a Friday morning. <coughs> so, um, introductions. So, Ruben. Ruben is the SVP and Chief Analytics Officer at Caesars Entertainment, where he's been since 2005. Um, he supports the analytics function across all the operating units of Caesars Entertainment. And as we go through the discussion this morning, he's going to tell us a little bit about what it means by gaming analytics and labor analytics and how analytics helps drive their operation. Um, we know that analytics is really important at Caesars because Ruben flew out late yesterday evening to be with us, whereas prior this week, he was at the board meeting for Caesars doing, a lot of, I think you said, at least two presentations. So, so it's clearly an important driver of the way they think of their business. Um, next in line, Alfredo Catoriano, who's the CAO at Ford Motor Credit. Um, he's been there since 2002, is an alumni of AT&T and Lucent. He, like me, is an econometrician by training. And when we were getting together yesterday, we were kicking things back and forth about structural models and instrumental variables and time series analysis and all sorts of stuff like that. So that we had a great little bit of conversation and catching up. Um, his claim to fame, it, uh, apart from being the CEO at Ford Motor Credit, of course, his claim to fame is that uh, he was at George Mason University at the same time and was a research assistant to James Buchanan and any of you in the room that are economists will know that James Buchanan has won the Nobel Prize. He's now no longer with us, but he won the Nobel Prize in that year for his analysis of public policy. And he created a framework that kind of showed that politicians do lots of things just before they get elected that ends up creating more trouble than solving problems. And you might say, well, that's pretty obvious. But he actually <laughs> <coughs> created, a, created a theoretical framework within which to do that. And I wondered whether we could apply the same theoretical framework to uh, privacy laws, just in passing. But anyway. And then finally, by no means least, Michael Wu, that many of you will have met because Michael very kindly volunteered to do a session, which he did yesterday. Michael Wu is the chief scientist at Lithium. Um, he's passionate about the use of analytics in behavioral sciences and particularly because of what Lithium does with their, their uh, social network platforms of one sort and another. Um, uh, an, an expert on social data and the value that comes from social data. He developed the Facebook Engagement Index, 
Maybe somebody would like to ask him about that, because I'm not going to. That's a lead in, if you didn't quite get it. Um, the Community Health Index. In 2010, he was called out in CRM Magazine as an influential leader. And he's got two books, The Science of Social and The Science of Social 2. And when I was doing my homework for this session, I went on Amazon to see what the book was all about and what have you. And one of the reviews said, Dr. Wu is, is the one social media scientist and yet too humble of a man to even admit it, much less put it on his Twitter bio. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the panel. <laughs> okay, so um, we said we were going to talk about organization to start with. And, and I've got a question which is sort of a more of a three-part type of thing. Um, you know, here we are. Uh, we've got people called chief analytics officers. Um, we, we read more about it every day. There's more of them around than there were, than there used to be. But it's still a, it's still a relatively new thing, as we saw from the, from the little survey. Even in, an, even in a room like this where, where you know, the majority of people come from either are analysts themselves or they come from companies that use analytics, which is why they're here. So I thought it would be a good way to get started, just to sort of give you all an opportunity to talk about why did your company create the role that you're in? And, and where do you sort of fit in organizationally? Clearly, you know, you're probably high up the organization because we have this thing called chief analytics officers. And, 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 and maybe in passing, you know, as you, talk, as, you, as you think about that, talk about and help the audience understand how analytics drives your business. Ruben, maybe you could start and we'll just sort of go down the line to get, to get going here. Sure, thank you, Dr. Jennings. I appreciate being here. Uh, as far as the creation of, of the chief analytics role at Caesars, this was really a natural extension of the way that, that the organization has viewed itself for, for quite some time. Um, Caesars took a very different path towards how they intended to, to compete in the marketplace when they hired a Harvard Business School professor to be their, their CEO. It's a much different model than typical leadership within the gaming industry. Uh, and the way that that came about was that Gary, our, our CEO, wrote the then standing CEO a letter saying, here's a dozen things that you guys are doing terribly. Um, and then our CEO at the time responded by saying, OK, if you're so smart, then prove that you can do this better. Um, and the mandate really was at that point in time that we were going to distinguish ourselves within um, the industry by leveraging data and making that the core engine for how decisions would, would be um, instituted and integrated across all aspects of the operations. And as the organization continued to evolve and grow and add, add scale, uh, the design was really, let's add some formality around this. Uh, in a way that is not just symbolic, but also helps us become more efficient. And, and that's where the position um, really sort of evolved from. Uh, but it has a lot of interesting implications. And so you made reference to um, you know, my, my activities earlier this week. Uh, when we deliver a board presentation, it's not the uh, chief operating officer that delivers the operating results. It's not the financial uh, officer. Um, it's the analytics uh, that, that actually articulates the state of the, the operation, as well as the designs around how do we improve going forward. Uh, and again, that is a very specific orientation that um, the senior management team has embraced um, and is why I think we've gotten to the place that we are. And that was driven, that came from the top. It certainly did. And, and so your CEO now is a Harvard professor. Mm -hmm. uh, and did that, did that change generate lots of change in the rest of the management team? So do, does it work, you are in your job, and it works because the rest of the management team are analytic people? Or? Yeah, it certainly helps. Um, you know, the, the gaming industry is quite an interesting industry, and you'll have uh, individuals with very broad uh, backgrounds that, uh, that are in very important positions. And so you know, it, it's not necessarily sort of the, the traditional formal um, you know, homogenous view of what those backgrounds might be if you're thinking of a, of a purely analytics-driven group. Uh, but they are tremendously astute at understanding how to leverage analytics to, to drive business. And I think this has happened over years and years of this discipline and uh, emphasis that this is how we're competing. 
Um, and this is, uh, you know, the way, this is almost an, an arbitrage opportunity for us, whereas a number of our competitors will build a huge volcano in front of their, their organization to, to drive business. We think there's a different way that we might compete. Yeah, well, when you look at the volcano, you're outside the casino as well. You're not inside the casino. It's well, the volcano's going to be the quite one I think you're referring to. <laughs> Alfredo. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the journey at, at Four Credit uh, started 20 years ago, literally at the uh, basement of the headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan with five individuals with not very diverse backgrounds, uh, a few in OR, finance, and uh, pretty lucky in the sense that there was one individual with artificial intelligence. That really allows to start developing a scorecards, what we call kind of a hybrid. It's not just a typical statistical framework, but actually they start working from the beginning with the AI uh, field. Then after that, really, uh, they belong to the IT organization, and you know, uh, start creating just the databases needed to really do analytics for, for a corporation. Over the years, they start expanding the team, but as um, Ruben mentioned and Andrew mentioned, it is mainly the help from the top. Uh, when a president from American Express joined for credit and had the vision and really uh, provided the support for this team to be growing, uh, we have tried different ways in the terms of the business model. Right now, we have a centralized organization. And right now, at the moment that um, was created the position of a chief analytics officer, is to really start making it to be an, a skill team that you have in corporations, like HR, like legal. So right now, we're officially a skill team. We do all the administrative things that probably sometimes we don't like it that much, but we have to do them, very important. And this is really give us not only a seat on the table, but really formalize to be a, a, a skilled team at Four Credit. Michael. Um, so Lithium is a social media company. So we are different than a lot of the social media that you're familiar with, such as Facebook and Twitter, in that we are social media for enterprise. Um, so for that reason, we actually collected a lot of data on uh, our, the customers of the enterprise who's interacting with our platform. And so we, basically the role of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, chief uh, analytic officer or chief scientist were created because, because you know, this, actually they need people to actually look at all those data and make sense out of it, build data product that differentiates us from the rest of the uh, uh, the competitors out there, and also be able to kind of explain it in a way such that uh, business stakeholders actually understand it. So that's uh, in in reality kind of you know why that was that I would kind of be at where I am now. Um, but the journey to getting there was was quite interesting. I was actually hired um, uh, into Lithium as a, a data engineer. Basically, I uh, I you know work with the engineering team and then. Um, <coughs> You know, build, try to build data products, trying to find insights from data, from data. And it wasn't until I was able to demonstrate that you know the value and the power of you know the insight that we that we could glean from data, and which is and then the, it basically opened their eye, and it's like, well, this is what you can do with data. And then they um, kind of start to focus on, okay, now continue to play with that data, play a little more. And then, so the first time I got told to play, you know, with it. so that's kind of comforting. Um, and now, you know, I think a few years later, you know, like um, I think Lithium uh, had actually, you know, made data our differentiation, uh, part of our differentiation, just like Caesar and, and Ford Credit. Um, that you know, so now it becomes very critical uh, to have someone who, as essentially, as a thought leader in the industry, as well as a, a leader in the company, who could um, be drive the innovation in data product. So I think what you just sort of think describing at the end there, um, you open people's eyes to the power of the of the data and to the information. And a couple of weeks ago, actually probably nearly a month ago, I was actually in Vegas, which I made the reference to the volcano because I stood outside and watched it. <laughs> See, it works. <laughs> right. And, the, and I, I apologize, the conference was in the Bellagio, which I don't <laughs> think is one of your properties. But but the, it was a chief analytics officer one day sure. conference thing. And, and there was a lot of discussion there about um, you know, people, I think, probably earlier in the journey than you are. They had, either they may have had a chief analytics officer or they had people that were kind of moving in that direction. And, 
and there was a lot of discussion about, um, you know, does the business, are you there because the business is pulling from you? Or, you know, I'm not, I've now got this title and I'm going to, and somebody, somebody upstairs thought analytics, they read about analytics in the newspaper and thought, we better have some of that. So let's get somebody in. And they didn't, you know, and they're worried about, well, what does the rest of the business think about all of this? And so as you've, as you've gone through your journey at your relative companies, because, you know, it didn't, as you say, it didn't happen kind of overnight. What, what did you learn about this sort of, the, the balance between the, I need to prove value to everybody else to justify that I'm here as an analytics person, as against the business coming to you and say, we're so glad you're here, now we need all these things. Uh, I'll take the first shot yeah. at it. The, I think with any process of change within an institution, that, that change gets much more easily facilitated when there is you know, an immediate win associated with it. And you know, within our own organization, as I mentioned, the mandate that, that Gary came with was that he was going to create a discipline here. Um, but as the organization became, you know, evolved and uh, took different forms, ev with every one of those changes, we've been quite clear to try to identify an immediate quick win that was meaningful, visible, um, and, and lasting that would be facilitated by the change. Otherwise, why make the change? Yeah. And that was true in, in, in the part of, of creating the, the, the current organization that we have as well. Part of what I really enjoy about my job is that there is, you know, the, the disciplines are quite varied. The, um, the areas of the businesses that we touch are, are quite broad, but there's also a lot of overlap. And then recognizing that overlap was you know, part of the push to say, if we consolidated this, there's a whole series of benefits that um, we believe that we would be able to, to execute against. And in fact, there are a handful of, uh, of these opportunities that we believe are very close to the finish line. Mm -hmm. um, and that has enabled us to, to create more of a, of a pool model. Um, it's not uniform, but when you do have that, that track record, um, people really are looking for every advantage that they can get. And when there's a real um, belief that this is an opportunity or a way to, to get that, that, that advantage, um, things become quite, uh, quite easier. Well, for us, uh, in our journey, as I mentioned, kind of at 20 years, probably three quarters was mainly a push. Mm -hmm. It's like a looking for opportunities, making presentations, and doing a lot of selling. In the last few years, really, the culture has changed. And also, during those times that we were the push, you really need the, the top executives really helping by just asking their direct reports when they come up with ideas, have you checked with Global Analytics? Have you really passed the idea and trying to help you in some kind of a, your business case quantifications? In, in, the, in, the, in the last few years, it, it's very nice because now, especially in all these uh, big data and digital environment and digital projects, is really they are inviting us. Right now, it's really that um, we, we start saying sometimes no because you have to set up priorities and you have limited resources. So it's really nice for all of us when we meet is really the, the change in the culture and and um, finally, uh, still there are a few things that we do on ourselves and we try to really uh, to do the selling, but it's maybe 10, 15, 20%. 80% is really they are pulling us uh, to the table, which is really nice. Which is like it should be once it's an established function. Established, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Michael, you want anything to add? Or? Sure, um, so I think, uh, so first maybe let me clarify a little bit the difference between what data and analytic is. Because I think a lot of people don't uh, maybe have some confusion. Because early on at Lithium, uh, just because you have data, it doesn't mean it's analytic. Like a lot of times, uh, analytics, you know, function basically started with just reporting, just getting the data for people to uh, getting people access to the data, so they actually see the data, and to, so they could use those data to help them make better decisions. And once you have uh, access to those data, then they start to, you know asking you, well, what does this data mean? You know, then you start to build models. You can, you can start, to, start to predict, right? So you go from a very descriptive type of analytics to more of a predictive type of analytics. Then it you know, becomes really powerful, because it could tell you things that, 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 you, know, that you, you, know, you wouldn't know um, ahead of time. And once you start doing that, then they start to say, well, if you could tell all this stuff, can you, you know, optimize you know, like, you know, from, from data um, 
what I should do in order to get the outcome that I want. So that's, you know, it's another shift, again, to, from descriptive to predictive to prescriptive, right? So in, in a way, that's kind of how um, lithium's kind of data journey has evolved. Yeah. Because, so in some ways, all analytics is about reporting in that you've got to be able to communicate. So, you know, we, we, you know we, we might all get off on our machine learning algorithms and you know, the, the, you know, pages and pages of charts or whatever it may be, or, or tables probably more than likely than charts. So what have you learned about how to present results so that business people, they might, you know, have the, they, even if they're analytically minded, they may not have the time to plow through. I mean, and you probably don't. So how does your team present results to you? What have you learned along that journey that could be useful to the audiences? And, and again, this, this, I'll say this because it was fascinating to me. At this, at this same conference that I referenced, a person was asked, what was the most important hire that you made? And they said it was a journalist <laughs> to write reports, to write stories. So how, how does that work in your respective organizations? How, does, how do you get people to understand what you're talking about? Yeah, so Dr. Wu and I actually were, were talking about this a bit um, before the, the presentation started, and I thought he was quite insightful um, in describing what the nature of his role is. And, and part of what he described, and I think it's very true for, for myself as well, is that I, the, the, this position is intended to create the narrative translation of the, the work that we do so that it gets an easy integration into the operations. Um, and that is a very hard skill to identify mm -hmm. within, within you know, the talent in this space. It's, not the, um, it's actually, I find, easier to find individuals who have um, the intellectual horsepower to do the analytics the translation piece is, is the part that tends to distinguish senior management from um, you know, the broader talent pool. <clears throat> For us, we have, again, we, we benefit from having a, a CEO who is truly world class at, mm -hmm. at describing uh, this intersection. And probably detail orientated at the same time. And, and yeah. extremely intuitive insi and insightful yeah. about the work that, that we do. We also spend a tremendous amount of time with the operators, so that we aren't, um, so that we are sharing a same language around how do you um, actually facilitate their decision making. Um, that I think is something that um, is is a core element of how we we drive the business. The the work that we do on the technical side is is fundamental, but the distinguishing trait is really the the time spent with the operations. I imagine it's the same thing in your it, world. That's right. Uh, yeah. We have kind of a two-step process. Uh, first, we have kind of the technical papers that will be leading to publications or, or to patents. And those ones have to go through what we have is the analytics uh, technical review committee. So this is kind of our comfort zone. So this mm -hmm. we do very well. For the second step, what we do, we all the time we partner with our business partners. So into tailoring those presentations to really before we present it to, to, the, to the audience, you know, that could be definitely the business audience. So in that case, we, we, that's what we have. We work very close from the beginning of the project uh, with the business partners. Then we have kind of, a, we go into isolation a little bit into this uh, technical component. And then we, we start partnering, really tailoring those presentations because that's very important. And that goes into the hiring, right? When we hire, it's not just having great technicians coming into the company, but with good interpersonal skills, teamwork, and communication skills. Yeah, so communication, no matter whether it's what function it is, communication is key. That's right. At the you end, can't uh, uh, translate uh, it into what's the impact on the business. And you know, that's one of the things that, that, that we have to do as well. And even you know, in, in my world, right, when I've I got analytics people, it's, OK, that's all great, but what does it mean? Uh, and if you can't tell that story, then, then you're going to spend a lot of time pushing and not, gonna, not getting a lot of pull for your services. And, and when we hire them, with the, you're an applied scientist, but you are going to become an internal consultant. This is yeah. how we see ourselves in Global Analytics. Okay, so let's, let's switch gears a little bit. And, and, you know, it's an analytics conference. We're analytics people. We've got to talk about analytics, not just, you know, where you fit in the business. So, Michael, you, you gave a, a presentation yesterday about sentiment analysis. 
and um, I thought it's fascinating, especially being when your comments about, about um, sarcasm and being from across the other side of the Atlantic Ocean where I think the whole country runs on sarcasm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so that was probably a sarcastic I don't know, maybe it was. <laughs> um, you know, and you, you, you were, you know, I think you, you cast, you, you gave a realistic view of what the value of social data is. And, and we read about it all the time, you know, it's like, you, it's got to be social. Give, give us your perspective, because that's really the world that you live in. What really is the value of social data? And give us, and, you know, and maybe examples of people who do that well and people who do it less well. Yeah. So um, there's definitely a lot of very useful information in uh, social media, right? I mean, I mean you know, who, who here doesn't use social media? Who doesn't use social media? Not, not one, right? So obviously, it's used somehow useful for you, right? So it's useful at the individual level, right? But um, you know, the question is, is it actually useful for the company, right? So very often, if you are a small, medium-sized business, you know, uh, very often, you could just look at the data and, and it already help you make some decision, right? The person who runs the taco truck business, right? If you could just look at the tweets, where are people tweeting about they're hungry, just drive there, right? And that's enough to drive in business. But, but for a big enterprise like most of you here, you, know, you need to do more sophisticated, like uh, uh, you know, from descriptive to predictive, <laughs> maybe pres prescriptive, right? Some type of uh, modeling exercise to extract these insights out. I think that, um, so there's definitely a value there, and I think the most important thing is that I come back to your comment about is how does it actually drive uh, business result? What's the impact? What's the financial impact on business, right? What's the bottom line? What's the top line impact? I think those are, you know, um, you know, uh, we, basically it comes again to a, uh, a correlation type of study, right? Some kind of regression correlation analysis, and then you could actually see what's the impact. So for that's, first step, right? And then you, uh, of course, establish correlation. Next uh, obvious question that most people will ask, so, well, if it's correlated, now, what if, do, how do I know it's actually causal, right? Only if it's causal, then I, when I want to push it, I could actually affect it, right? Because otherwise, it's just, it's just correlation. It's just nice to see the result. So that's uh, basically the, usually the, the next step. When you actually, some company that does really well is one of our, our client, um, start with a G, <laughs> with a big search company. Uh, they, they are um, very innovative in a way that a, they um, actually wanted to actually uh, dig deeper than beyond correlation. They want to actually see if social media on our platform is actually driving uh, their uh, NPS, driving their uh, uh, sales, driving their CSAT. You know, so we actually had a study with them. So that's I'm not allowed to talk too much about it because, uh, but. Um, we were actually thinking of writing a Harvard Business Review together, but um, so to be continue on that. <laughs> <laughs> there's, it seems that there's still though a lot of value in, uh, much of the value might be in simply assembling information. Uh, I mean, the, the example, the taco truck, uh, that's not, you know, it's purely analytic people, we probably wouldn't call that analytics, but knowing where people are. Uh, the example I think yesterday of, you know, my aircraft, my, you know, United app doesn't actually do this at the moment as far as I know, you know, knows that I'm in, I'm in where I am in the airport and therefore, you know, I am here and I'm on my way and hold the plane. I don't suppose they do that, but anyway. So, but that's, that's assembling a data. Is it, do you see more of that happening at this point in time as opposed to extracting information and putting it into models? Yeah, I think that's, Def, that's a very simple use. That's, that's basically using existing data, right? You're just simply using the data at the right time, the right moment to benefit people. And that's one very useful case. That's, I will classify that in the descriptive uh, type of analytic, like you're just summarizing data or presenting data in a way that's useful. Um, I think an area where that is social media could provide extremely, it could be very extremely valuable is is to actually understand uh, what people are actually talking about, right? So stuff like sentiment analysis, topic discovery, right? You know, so there's all these, uh, say, conversations about your brand, right? But what are they talking about your brand? You know, are they, uh, are they complaining? Are they, are they happy? Are they excited about your brand? You know, or what are they talking about you? So I think that's the type of um, 
analysis where you actually need to do much more, uh, I think, text analytics to actually do processing on the text to build models and then to extract the information out. And, and I think that could be very, very valuable, both for marketing and also customer support as well as innovation, right? Because if you, if you could, you know, if you have a text analysis engine, right, that can understand text and give you topics, right, you could feed them in all the cases that, uh, that have come to you, right? All the cases, uh, support cases or service cases come to you. You can actually understand what is the problem, right? Which, which, what, which problem has actually the, occur most frequently and they go tackle those problems, right? So that, I think that's one very simple use case. The marketing use, is, use case is, is obvious because now uh, you can actually listen and understand what the customers are saying, right? It's actually like kind of like getting to their mind, right? You have a feedback loop. One of the most important thing about optimizing any process is that you need that feedback data, right? And social media actually provide that feedback loop from the customer back to the company. Well, I know there's some people in the audience, I'm, well, I'm guessing they're in the audience, that are passionate about test and learn and experimentation, so there might be some questions on that. Let me, let me come to Ruben, and I'm going to come back, back to you, Alfredo. I mean, your, your, your business is, well, all your businesses are about customers, but, but you, you know, you're, a lot of what you do, I think, you know, when you talk about gaming analytics, is you're watching what customers are doing, literally. Um, and so... Tell us, tell us how you, you use analytics to make that customer experience better, both for you as an organization and for the, and for the people that are, are in the hotels and in the properties. And, and to what extent does the test and learn aspect of what Michael was talking about get into your business? Sure, well, we have, it's deeply integrated. We, we have a, a very specific formal learning agenda that is continuously updated and, and actually ratified by our senior management team, mm -hmm. um, which is intended to be a very um, well-decided, well-structured uh, sort of implementation of, of that process. Um, you know, as far as what we do, there's, it's very broad-based, and that's what I like about it. Um, and I think that in some ways it's quite intuitive because you know, a lot of people who've even though not everybody raised their hands, I think most of you guys understand <laughs> what happens in a, <laughs> in a casino. But um, so I, I'll just give you an example. Um, so a number of you have probably uh, went through a table games floor, you know what blackjack is, um, and you may have seen in, within the casino there's you know, a whole bunch of staff and there's surveillance everywhere. Um, the things that, that drive the economics of, of, a, of a gaming floor are, are very specific. So the number of players on a given game, the advantage of the game, the skill of the player, the speed um, of the, the dealer, the average bet, and so forth. And these are things that, um, when you think about how, all the inputs that are required to optimize the product offering and the labor applied against it, it's actually quite complex. Um, and for most organizations, for a long time, that was a, quite a manual exercise. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be. And what, one of the things that, that we keep spending time with now is you know, where are the gaps in our data that we know are necessary to optimize the operations, and do we have to accept that, that gap needs to exist? Uh, so a specific example around this is if, if you're betting a few hundred thousand dollars a hand uh, uh, at every game, and I can assure you, you will get more attention than a newborn baby. We will capture every single thing that happens. Uh, but if you're betting a couple hundred dollars a hand, we'll capture things based on sample. That, that is sort of the industry standard. The individuals yeah. will go around and monitor, take a sample, move on. Um, that sample will create a, a wide range of variability in, in the accuracy of what, what we're actually observing. And so. Uh, most recently, we've been able to, to identify that we, can, we don't have to accept that variability. We, we can begin to, to leverage you know, surveillance information and translate that in a way that is quite structured and now gives us the same level of precision uh, that we should expect if we were literally sitting over your shoulder and watching everything that occurs. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting hypotheses that then generate from this. We know that your service experience matters in terms of the way that you behave. Um, our customers are... We call them promiscuous, and we mean this in a very specific <laughs> way. Um, but they, they tend to walk around and, and visit a lot of our, our competitors. And part of that promiscuity is driven by the way we treat you. Not surprising. Uh, that's a broad-based learning. Um, but 
we can actually start to, getting back to this notion of sentiment analysis, we can start to think about, well, can we capture some of these things in real time? Yeah, social media is wonderful, but even just monitoring you know, the facial expressions and uh, how people are engaging with you know, our staff and, and in turn how they're, uh, they're engaging is interesting. And we're getting to the points where we think we can have some very definitive views on, on training, on operations, and how we evaluate staff and that that will translate uh, directly into to financial outcomes. So it's um, you know, a lot of what I find exciting about, about MySpace now um, is really going back to fundamentals, knowing here's what matters about the business. Right. Yeah. Here's what we always assumed we just wouldn't know or you couldn't know perfectly that actually maybe you can know quite, if not perfectly, in a more comprehensive way or a much more informed way. Right. So it gets back to this the analytics is grounded in the in the fundamental profitability drivers of the organ. This is not this is not the university of Caesar's entertainment. Right? This is this is these things, the number of games in an hour or how many people are at the table or whatever, drive fundamentally drive the profitability. And so those are the things that we apply the analytic yeah, method to. Yeah, we refer to that you know, as first principles and, and we begin every conversation with what's first principles. Yeah. And from there, identify, well, can we, can we optimize or find benefits on the margin based on, on these approaches? Right. Now, I know in Ford, right, so in the motor business, residual values drive, drive a lot of the profitability. So I think when we were chatting earlier, you were talking about, we were sort of talking about how innovation and, and this sort of how you divide resources up between the things you have to do every day and, and trying new things, and you were talking about the residual value problem. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that as an example of how analytics is deep in your organization. Absolutely. Analytically, econometrically is the most challenging forecast that we have to do is to forecast the value of the car three, four years mm -hmm. uh, into the future. And based on that, we set it up prices. And then if uh, we know that we're going to be wrong, but you try to really minimize that uh, so that uh, we can all, uh, all make money. Um, but then back to the question with respect to the customers. In, in our organization, we see that we have uh, external customers, which is actually developing the analytics to provide the, the best service in terms of the originations with a pricing optimization engine in the servicing, uh, what is the best way to reach these customers, what is the optimal timing to reach these customers, and then our internal customers from developing optimization engines to run the most effectively, efficiently our operations, to, to the treasury, building counterparty risk models uh, to minimize the risk that we have with all the banks that we deal around the world on a daily basis. So in that sense, you know, we, we have those kind of uh, external and uh, internal customers. Right. I think you were saying that though in, the, you, in that particular example, you'd, you'd experimented with new techniques, uh, machine, like, just like big data is all the rage, machine learning is all the rage, and you, you, you tried some of those techniques and what did you That's find? right. What we were talking is about that the way that we see innovation is uh, we try to look at it in a baby steps. It's not trying to develop the new relativity theory that would be really nice, the unified theory for in terms of physics. But it is really to, to come up to improve those models. And in that one, it's actually back to our comfort zone, to our playground. We keep reviewing the literature and we look for challengers in the econometric, mathematics, and in all these spaces. And then whenever really pays off, and sometimes just finding out that doesn't pay off. It, it is just a good information that what you're using is the best that you could be using for, uh, for the business. Okay, so I've got one eye on the clock here, and the time's running away from us, so I'm gonna try and make something work. There we go, Does that come up there? Yeah, so the, the, the last topic we were gonna touch on, I think we can't talk about analytics without talking about talent, and I thought this was a bit of fun, so we put this up here. So um, earlier in the year, Darcy and the marketing team created this little infographic about what makes a good data scientist, and, mm -hmm. not so, and it's, we've got it in Chinese and Spanish and English, right? and it's a lot of things, and you can't see quite all of the picture because it's a big one. Um, but if you're interested in this, I'm sure we can get you a, a, a copy of it if you'd, if you'd like one to stick on your office wall. So, but in all seriousness, so the talent question. So let's just, Go down the line. Let's we'll start with Ruben. How, how do you, how do you, where do you find talent? What, what, what are you looking for? And, and 
I know that's a broad question because you're looking for more than one thing, but sort of just talk about how, how you think about molding a team and the types of questions and skills that you look for. Well, when you first started the conversation, you, you asked about you know, sort of why have the position. Part of what um, we believed and I think has bared itself out is that by creating a, the right structure, you will increase the, the value proposition to potential uh, employees and that in turn will allow you to, to get a, a consistently high caliber of individual. And so the structure actually quite is important for, for us in terms of enabling um, being able to get talent. Now, in terms of what we're specifically looking for, um, you know, I think we're all sort of looking for a, a certain benchmark as it relates to technical skills. We tend to find the distinguishing factors around things like you know, individuals who have a persistent curiosity about the business, mm -hmm. um, individuals who recognize this is not an academic exercise. Um, and that are, they are relentless about that intersection. Um, that uh, can be a very challenging thing to screen for, um, but it's not that, that, that difficult. Um, people that, that, that really like what we do um, and have the, a certain uh, technical capability do Come to tremendously you. well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's... <laughs> and, uh, as a very specific aside, we tend to do really well with poker players for some reason. <laughs> um, we have people who've made literally millions of dollars playing poker who will take a $50,000 job as an analyst because they really like this. Um, and they are really good employees. <laughs> they get a staff discount at the table. <laughs> I don't tend to follow them when they go to the floor. Alfredo. For hiring, the, the best that works for us is definitely summer internships. You can see them for a few months, then postdoc positions individuals who still want to uh, do more research after they finish their PhDs. And then the other one is uh, we have uh, university alliances that in the last 20 years uh, has been developed the legal framework to protect the intellectual property, the patents, and the professors can publish. So by doing that, we develop a strong relationship with the professors the, who, is, who are going to tell you who are the best students. And those are the ones who we bring for summer internship or postdocs. So that, that's usually the best. Uh, what about you, Michael? What do you, what yeah, do you so, you know, as most of you know that, you know, like data scientists is kind of named the sexiest job in the 21st century by Harvard Review, right? So um, as a result, you know, actually everybody who work with data in some, any capacity want to call themselves a data scientist, right? So it's automatically raise your, your market value <laughs> tremendously. So I actually, you know, create a lot of confusion uh, for people because, especially for people who want to hire data scientists, and I think, you know, it might be worth to kind of look at, you know, what does this data scientist, you know, really mean? You know, because I mean, you know, to me, the data scientist actually is, is three different roles. You know, there are people who are works at the infrastructure layer, right? They work with the big data stack um, where they capture, store, process, and allow you to query the data. So these are the, they're basically data engineers, right? I would call them, uh, they're basically computer scientists and who work with data. And, and then there's also the next layer up, right? The, and that I call the algorithm layer. These are people who actually build algorithm, build models, right? And, and uh, predict things and, and optimize things. Um, and then at the top layer, there are these uh, uh, decision science um, analysts, right? They're basically business analysts. And so, um, so the, one of the things that, you know, why data scientists is so difficult and so expensive is you're actually looking for someone who could do all three, right? And that's actually very difficult, right? I actually don't do all three. I'm kind of in the middle layer. I'm the algorithm person and also kind of somewhat a little bit, on, little bit on, the, on the infrastructure, mainly algorithm, and then I bleed into the, the decision science layer as well, mm. right? So, the way we kind of overcome this expensive you know, price tag of data scientists is that we, we actually don't try to hire one person who could do all three of them. We hire three different people and make them work together, right? And that's actually turned out to be much more um, uh, uh, economically, you know, like it's, it's cheap, much cheaper. Right? Also, in the, in the long run, they become more productive as well. And you know, the, another side benefit that we observe is that if you do that, you know, there's room for them to learn. Right? If you hire an algorithm person, you know, they could you know, learn uh, the, the infrastructure, uh, the new techniques in the infrastructure in, 
Storm in Impala and all that stuff, right? The, all the big data stack, right? And then the, if you hire a data engineer who doesn't know much about uh, machine learning, they could learn about those stuff, right? It's more motivating for them. You actually keep them longer. One of the problem of you know hiring a data scientist who's a rock star with all three is that like you know you, you may not be able to keep them very long, right? They jump ship. So um, so that's kind of how we uh, overcome this problem. Thank you. So I think now is a good time to open things up to the audience. Have we got the usual roam there? That's better. We can see now, see you, and you can, we've got the roaming mics, and please put your hand up, and if you wouldn't mind telling us who you are and where you're from. Just on the last point, uh, if I look at HSBC, they've got chief data officers around global banking and markets, Chief, uh, chief data office for risk, for finance. Are we not breaking all these silos and up? Is that an observation, or are we breaking all the? Are they like? So what, Steve? It was Steve, wasn't it? The question is, yeah, chief data officer. Well, I think I don't know. You, 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 you have. I think maybe you're closer to that. Are you in an organisation yeah, your size? chatting about that, you know, chief analytics officer start coming up in corporation and then I was invited to a chief data officer summit. The, the way that I see it is a little bit more in, in the IT space, mm -hmm. uh, even though you also have the CIOs, the chief yep. information officer. Mm -hmm. So um, I see a lot of uh, maybe um, intersection between the CDO and the CIO. I think the chief analytics officer, what we want to see is more applied scientists that we are building models. This is how we see ourselves. We used to have at the beginning, like uh, uh, Dr. Wu mentioned, is uh, at the beginning we do a lot of reporting, being involved a lot uh, with the data, the databases. But now we have different organizations really does reporting, and we are more like a sometimes in conference they refer to as a medium advanced analytics, and this is what, uh, what we do. But you're right, I don't know exactly the, the, the if the CDO is a part of the CIO, that could be, because it's one of the functions of IT in our corporation. Certainly my casual empiricism is that chief data officers tend to live in IT and analytics officers ought to live in the business. Yeah, because I mean, of the, all the things we've been talking about, Michael. Yeah, let me just one more comment on that is, you know, so if you look at that three layer again, right, the infrastructure layer, algorithm, and decision science, right, the infrastructure usually uh, are closer to the IT you know, uh, operation. And the uh, algorithm is actually closer to the, what we do, right? Uh, we build models, and then, uh, and then the top layer, you know, uh, they're closer to the business, right? Mm -hmm. so. There's one more down here. Yep. Yes, hi, this question is uh, for Ruben. You said in order to gain credibility, you had to generate a quick, visible, lasting win. Could you give an example of one of those? Sure, so and I think this is, yeah, I think this is actually quite a useful approach if you're gonna take on any sort of material change. For us, when we were um, going through the process of, of centralizing the, the analytics function, there were a handful of projects that, that frankly were just resource constrained. And as we were, and what we were also finding that these projects would benefit a bit more from a broader uh, discipline base. Um, you know, people with skills that, that were specific to our, uh, different functions that we had. And it was actually pretty obvious when you, when you laid out, here's how you would solve a certain problem, here's the commercial application. And, um, and then in doing so, we presented to the CEO and said, once we centralize, I've already got people who I think can work this out quite quickly, um, and here's how you would, uh, here's the path to, to integration. Um, and so even before announcing that we were going through this path, we'd mobilized a bit, so we cheated. Um, but that was, that was by design, because we knew that that would give the, the organization some confidence. I, I'm, I'm being a little bit vague for proprietary reasons, but um, a lot of this was around you know, pricing and customer valuation, and it was, is something that we could also demonstrate obvious bottom line wins uh, against. And, and what was also true is that um, you could extend that to regions of the company that, that really wasn't playing in this space. 
And so um, you could get, you could generate a, a, a broader dialogue. Um, so we, this was very, very methodical and done with, with design, knowing that this type of integration is, takes a long time and it's, it's a lot of change. Um, so for us, that, without that, it would have been, I think, very difficult to have the runway to do all of the work to, to, to formalize the, the, the organization that we have now. One more over here. Uh, thank you. Um, George Vanacek, product development here in FICO. Uh, I think this is a question for Michael. Um, so a lot of the discussion that we've had here is about uh, collecting a lot of data, you know, and storing it in uh, HDFS or some, you know, large warehouse, and then being able to process that data to, you know, run analytics on it to do decisioning. Um, but as we saw yesterday, it's kind of like looking in the rear view mirror, and it's very historical in nature. What we're seeing now is that, you know, we're moving towards a, a world where, especially in Ford, you know, we have hundreds of sensors all around. We've got uh, billions of devices. We talked about mobile yesterday with Ms. Lopez and so forth. Um, what I'm saying, what I'm asking is, uh, the question is, um, there is um, more and more data that's going to be um, data in motion as opposed to data at rest that has to be analyzed. And much of this data we're not going to be able to store. We're going to have to look at the data as it's coming through, make some decisions about it in near real time, and then not have the ability to retrieve the data from, from store to analyze. So my question to you is, how do you see us moving forward uh, uh, from sort of the data address and big data to data in motion and how to analyze it? Well, I mean, there, there are uh, platforms that, you know, open source platforms even, to allow you to analyze these uh, streaming data, right? So Storm and, you know, particularly, and you could, you could certainly use those. And I think how much data you want to store is actually up to, uh, up to you. I mean, there's not, there's, you don't have to store everything, right? Sometimes you could derive some insights out of those data and then store the insights that you, uh, that you gather and then discard the, the data that you don't need anymore. And so that's uh, a business decision rather than, a, I would say, uh, more of an analytics or data um, decision. Andrew, I, 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 I would like just to add to uh, the prior question. In, in our experience, really, if you're in the earliest stage of analytics, maybe look into your operations. Those are the big uh, impact that you can have in the company, long lasting for us, was in terms of an optimal staffing models. Mm -hmm. Telling them exactly in the business center how many people they should have. And the other one, you know, they, they're, they're just, the titles speak by themselves. Optimal assignment timing is when to start contacting a customer when he's delinquent, and then you can even go into the channels. Well, this customer, maybe an email, maybe a letter. So just in those ones, you know, in, in your operations, you can make significant difference, create big savings, build a reputation, build a credibility that then will take you into um, other fields. Have we got time for one more, or if there is one more? There's one here, one last one then. Hi, um, Peter Danforth from Loblaw Companies Limited. Uh, you all touched on the importance of bringing a narrative to your executives and making sure that it's actionable. Excuse me. And you also talked briefly about uh, correlation versus a causal relationship. Can you guys talk briefly about what sort of controls you have in place on your team to make sure that people aren't pushing narratives that might not be causal and will therefore not result in much impact? How do you control the sort of conflict between those two things? So... Yeah, Go the on. way we, we do it is, well, the simplest way to prove causality is experimentation, right? I mean, if you can, if you can uh, do experiment, uh, that's the, the easiest way to, to do it. And if you cannot, then uh, you have to use some more econometric uh, methods, such as instrumental variable, you know, grandeur, causality type of analysis and to, to prove the causality, so. But do, do you have any sort of checks and balances, perhaps, well, I think. we do. I, I believe I mentioned it. For us, we have the Analytics Technical Review Committee. So in that one, really has to first pass the technical before we really taking into putting into the narrative, into the PowerPoint presentation, if you want to call it, before we go to the, to the executives. Ruben, anything to add? No, I think that uh, Dr. Wu and, uh, and Alfredo hit it well. They, we actually ha are quite, um, 
fanatical about this notion of, uh, of experimentation. It, uh, Gary has got a, a saying that, that we quote often. It says there's, there's three ways to, to get fired at, at Caesars. You can steal, you can sexually harass, or you can run a test without a control group. And so, um, so we are constantly tinkering uh, against the, these, these design hypotheses and, and then in changing our, uh, our conclusions based on the results. Well, I think that's where we have to call it a wrap for today. And I'm sure the three, of, three will be around for a little while here. So if you've got any more questions, please seek them out. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.